Our very first presenter is uh, Dr. Chelsea Jarvis from the Research, uh, Research Fellow with the Centre for Applied Climate Sciences all the way from uh, the University of Southern Queensland. So probably a narrow escape from the virus there. <laughs> uh, I'm fully oh, probably that very good. Okay. Yeah, you can stay. Yeah. And uh, I have another hand growing out the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, you would know all about that being a scientist. So, uh, so yes, climate and weather necessarily shape many important aspects of the agricultural industries, from the field to the finished product. And uh, uh, Dr. Jarvis is a senior scientist at the University of Southern Queensland's Centre for Applied Climate Sciences, focusing on communicating advancements in climate science to primary producers to assist in on-property management. She works closely with the pastoral industry across Northern Australia, and now we hope Central Australia as well. So over to you, Chelsea. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, yeah, actually, as part of the Northern Australia Climate Program, we actually count this area as Northern Australia, so don't be offended. Um, if you want to be called Central Australia, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, anyway, so as Ian pointed out, my name is uh, Chelsea. Feel free to call me Chelsea. We don't need the Jarvis or the doctor or anything like that. Um, and I am with the Northern Australia Climate Program, also known as NACP. So this is mainly funded by Meat and Livestock Australia, along with the Queensland Government and the University of Southern Queensland. And we are composed of a research development and extension teams, with our research mainly taking place at the Bureau of Meteorology and the UK Met Office. And you might be like, why do we need people at the UK Met Office for Australian climate? And it turns out that our seasonal forecast model, so that's our like one month or three month model, actually starts at the UK Met Office. So any changes that are, are going to improve our model to help improve um, essentially forecasting specifically for Northern Australia starts at the UK. So we have people there being like, hey, let's not forget Northern Australia. Hey, let's not forget Northern Australia. And specifically researching things that are important to this area, such as um, better representing <coughs> thunderstorms in our seasonal models, um, better representing the start of the monsoon and understanding that and how that monsoon uh, comes across and then how some of that rain maybe gets diverted down to this area, things like that. We also developed some new products um, that are hopefully a bit more intuitive to use than the ones that are currently available. And then of course uh, we do extension. Uh, Emily Hines is your local extension officer, also known as a climate mate. Um, and she's available for you 24 seven. So if you ever have a question. <laughs> Let her know. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk today mostly about climate, but lots of people use the terms weather and climate interchangeably. But they're actually really different things. So weather is what happens in sort of the next seven to ten days, whereas climate is anything that's sort of two weeks, one month, three months, five years, ten years, a hundred years, whatever. Um, and there's actually, there are two different modeling systems that generate the forecast. So two completely separate entities or like systems generate forecasts. And so they're, they're quite different and you can't use a climate forecast or interpret a climate forecast the same way you can use and interpret a weather forecast, though lots of people do because it's not intuitive and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But mostly I like to talk about climate or rainfall variability. So because we're talking about rehydration um, at this field day and things like that, I'm going to be talking about rainfall because of course without rain, you have no rehydration. Well, unless you trucked it in. That'd be a bit expensive. Um, so the rainfall for this area is mostly um, driven by the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, anybody familiar with the PDO? No? Uh, and the Madden-Julian Oscillation. Anybody Madden-Julian Oscillation? Yep, we got a couple. Oh yeah, ooh, that one's popular. Um, and so these, these things, so the, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole occur on sort of a seasonal time frame. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is decades. And then the MJO is sort of two to three weeks. So they kind of, they control or influence uh, what's going to happen at sort of different scales. Um, and so if we look at rainfall, this is for um, Aleron here, 1890 to 2020. The median rainfall, the median annual rainfall from July to June for here is 280 millimeters. And so each one of these bars that's above the line, so a blue bar, 
is an amount above 280. So for example, this one is about 450 millimeters above 280. So what is that, six, seven, you know, something. Um, I have a PhD. <laughs> Um, and then anything below the line is less than 280. So, you know, lots of people like to talk about an average year, but actually, you know, how many years are average? So an average year would be bang on this line. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, maybe 12, 13, 14, let's say about 15. So in the past, 130 years, 15 have actually been average. So what, what that tells us is that most years we're either gonna get quite a bit more than we normally, than our median, and other years we're gonna get quite a bit less than our median. Another interesting thing to note on this is this darker blue line across here, and that shows the trend. So from 1890 to present, rainfall for this area has actually been increasing. Um, which is important to note. So, you know, if you would have started, if you would have bought your property sort of back in the mid 50s, um, <laughs> it would have been really tough. <laughs> so you essentially had back to back drought. Whereas if you came sort of in the mid 70s and thought that that was the normal climate, you probably think it's, it's gotten drier, but actually you, you just happen to show up at a really wet time. So important things to remember. Okay, so, um, one thing that I can't stress enough, you know, lots of people say, oh, Chelsea, I, never, I don't use a forecast. You can't trust him. Nah. And I'm like, that's fine. You actually don't even need to use a forecast. All you need to do is have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, a forecast isn't going to help you anyway, because if you don't have, so by a plan, I mean like, oh, uh, you know, if it hasn't rained enough by March 1st, I'm going to start selling off cattle and I know which cattle I'm going to sell. Or, you know, this year I'm going to do some um, start by land regen stuff um, by this date or this date, and that's the plan. But if you don't have certain dates in mind, then actually forecasts won't help you anyway. Because it's just, you know, oh, it's gonna rain, oh, it's not gonna rain. But um, we'll talk a bit more about that. So I argue that um, your plan, whatever your plan may be, um, can be informed by historical information. So if you never wanted to use a forecast, even just understanding your historical data can be really useful. Um, but then if you did want to use a forecast, we'll look at that as well. So this, um, I realize that there aren't a huge number of cattle producers in the room, but essentially um, this is accumulated gross margin, so sort of profit on cattle. So these are all different um, ways, like herd management, um, with the red being a high stocking rate, and then the other ones either varying by rainfall or varying by um, amount of feed or just having a moderate stocking rate. And we can actually see, um, so this is at Wambiana. I know it's in Queensland, but I've actually looked at NT data and it looks very similar. I just happen to like this, this graph. Um, so we see, you know, when we do have those really good rainfall years, you have people that tend to be like, whoa, let's slap a whole bunch of cattle on there. And they do. And as long as that high rainfall continues, they're, they're fine. They're making actually a lot more money. So the red is this high stocking rate. But then as soon as the rainfall drops off, we can see that that high stocking rate actually doesn't make as much money than a more moderate one. And of course, we all know that that would be related to sort of things like land condition, um, which we've been talking about a lot. And then actually, even when we do get the rainfall, that high stocking rate still doesn't recover to the same level as a more flexible or moderate stocking rate, just again, probably due to land condition. Um, so this is, you know, just sort of an example of how we need to really have a plan and having a part of that plan is having a realistic stocking rate and having decision dates or triggers or things like that um, that we can adjust numbers on because just having a constant high stocking rate has been shown across northern Australia to not work really well. Um, okay, so let's talk about historical data. So the first one. How much rain can you realistically expect? So realistic rainfall. Um, lots of people think that they get more rain than they actually do, and that's because lots of people tend to use a mean or an average. So your average, if you have 10 years of data, 10 years of rainfall data, you add up those rain, all that rainfall, divided by 10, that's your average. Whereas your median or middle number 
essentially you take those same 10 years of data, you line it up from smallest to highest, and you take the number in the middle, whatever that number actually is. There's no adding or anything like that. Um, and the median tends to be less than the average because the average will be skewed by really high rainfall events. And because we can never have negative rainfall events, there's nothing to balance out those really big events. So if we look at, this is again for Aleron. You can get this data online. Emily can show you where it is. Or if you want to come over to our booth, we have internet, so thanks Sky Muster. Um, okay, so if we look at our mean, you probably can't read this, so I'll tell you. Uh, the mean for March at Aleron is 38 mils. However, the median, which is what you can reliably expect to get, so you get your median in five out of 10 years, is only seven mils. So if you were hoping for sort of that last burst of rainfall, you're actually unlikely to get it. Um, you know, and it's, it's things like this, and it, it tends to be more pronounced here in um, the summer and spring, uh, summer and autumn, whereas if we, let's say, look at November, the average is 33 and the mean is 23. So there's not a huge amount of difference in the spring, it's more of a summer and autumn thing. But this can be important, you know, if you're just hoping, hoping, hoping for that last little bit of rain, it's important to remember that, you know, it might not um, come. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was understanding how our past season has been, because if we, if we kind of don't know really how our past season was, then we don't know what we need going into the next season. Um, this is a really handy tool, Climate App. Anybody use Climate App? Anybody seen this? Again, Emily, call her midnight, two in the morning, when you're awake, you can't sleep, she can help you out. Um, so again, you probably can't really see this, but it shows you, so this red line is how the rain has fallen for the past 12 months. So we see there was a big, um, gosh, really big, like 300 mils at Aleron just before Christmas, around Christmas. That sound right? Anybody here? Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, you know, the, some drips and drabs, actually something sort of in April and then, and then not too much, but that's pretty normal. Um, this darker blue line here is your median, and then all these other lines are other years of data. Um, so we look, we look at this and we go, oh, wow, we're, we're 260 mils above our, our annual median, but it all came at once. So it may have just gone straight to those creek beds and just, you know. Um, however, if we look at the past... 20, oh, sorry, this is 36 months. We're actually still a bit below our median over the past 36 months, just due to those real crap years in, in 18 and 19. Um, here, this, you know, this might not mean a whole lot because sandy soil wouldn't hold on to um, the water anyway, but it's just important to kind of think about where we are. Um, the next question, looking at historical data that we can answer, do climate drivers, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or the La Nina, or the Indian Ocean Dipole, things like that, do they impact your rainfall here? Because, you know, you're like, oh, Pacific Ocean's really far away, Indian Ocean's really far away, like, surely they don't actually do anything. Okay, well, so this is um, another website, um, and it essentially shows the chance of getting a certain amount of rainfall based on whether it's an El Nino year, so El Nino tends to be drier, when there's no event, or when it's a La Nina, which tends to be wetter. And we can actually, um, so there's the La Ninas. If we look at what happens in five out of 10 El Nino years, so in five out of 10 dry years, we get about 73 mils at Aleron. Uh, when there's no event, we get about 73. Okay, so not, not a huge amount of change there. However, in La Nina years, we get about 123. So we can see, actually, that maybe the El Nino doesn't actually dry us out too much, um, 2019 notwithstanding. Um, but during the La Ninas, we're, we're more likely to get more. Um, we can look at another one. Uh, in seven out of 10 El Nino years, we might only get 33. In, in seven out of 10 neutral years, 38. But in seven out of 10 La Ninas, 93. And so we can just see how you know, these climate drivers can shift the odds. And it doesn't mean that you are absolutely going to get 93 mils, but it means that the odds are shifted in your favor. Hun Hunger Games, anyone? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's like that, or like racehorses. Or stock market. Weather and climate's a lot like playing the stock market. Um, yeah. 
Okay, and you might say, well, okay, you know, fine, I, that's fine, Chelsea. Um, but I don't really buy into it. And you're like, okay, that, that's cool. Um, so this is the, the national cattle herd, so from the whole, whole country. And we can see that, you know, there's sometimes the, the herd numbers drop, and then herd numbers increase, and then herd numbers drop, and then herd numbers increase, and then there seems to be a cycle going on here, right? Well, turns out that it um, mostly aligns with these dry El Nino phases and wet La Nina phases. So generally when we have big El Ninos, herd numbers drop, but when we have La Ninas, people go back into herd building because suddenly everybody has grain. So I mean, because you're, you know, it, it, it does take quite a lot to get cattle to market from here, there might be some way that you could take advantage of this. If you know that your El Nino years tend to not be too bad, but it could be really crap for people in Queensland, there might be a way to take advantage of this cycle for this region. Um, I'm not actually going to show these because they, you can't read them, but essentially it's showing that, um, at least in the Barclay, oh, really? Okay, I'll skip it. Anyway, in the Barclay, you tend to get more um, pasture growth on uh, Mitchell, uh, most of them, during La Nina years. Okay, so seasonal forecast, because that's what we talk a lot about. Um, in order, anybody use a seasonal forecast? So this is a three month? Yep, cool. Um, so they can be a bit confusing because we see all this blue and we're like, woo, it's gonna flood. Um, but actually, uh, most of these forecasts are issued as a chance of exceeding median. So you need to know what your median is in order to correctly interpret this. This forecast happens to be for October. Um, and so the median for October here is, you know, like 10 mils or something. So it, it looks really nice and sexy, but actually 10 mils isn't probably terribly exciting for most people. So it's just, it's just important to remember that the colors are just showing chance of exceeding median, but we don't know how much more than the median. We don't know when in that month it's going to happen um, and things like that. So they're like, they're a vibe. They're showing you, oh yeah, there's rainfall around, but you know, um, here's, what I call a dry forecast. And generally, you know, most people like to look at this one and go, ooh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope for rain on this one. And you can, I mean, that's, you know. But if, if you're not into forecasts, if you don't trust them, I would advise that you would trust a forecast that looks like this, um, because the bomb tends to predict dry conditions better than wet conditions. And also, if you have dry conditions, so it, this was a forecast for October to December 2019. It was issued in September. And it, it would have looked like this in August too. So about the time um, that some people are mustering, you know, we already know you're, you're probably not really gonna get any rainfall until at least January. And depending on how much feed you currently have, if you saw a forecast like this, you might end up trying to sell a bit more rather than try to hold them through the next three or four months. Um, so yeah, it's important. And then if you do get rain, oh, winning, you know, you can spell some land or something, but at least you haven't held on and hoped for rain. This is a no hope forecast. Don't, don't hope for rain when you see something that looks like that. Let's skip that. Um, how can we use a seasonal forecast? So I just mentioned it, adjusting um, herd numbers and stocking rate. Um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, doing like major earthworks in order to, um, you know, help um, rehydrate the land and things like that. If you know you're going to come, be coming into some dry conditions, because these things go in cycles, um, maybe it isn't the right time to go splashing out a bunch of money to, to do earthworks moving when it's just going to be dry for the next couple of years. Things like that. But if you know what year's coming, you might kind of move up that timeline to get those uh, weirs and things in before the rain comes. So real quickly, what's to come? Um, November, chance of exceeding median. Most places it's um, over 50%. Less clear for December. December is 50-50 at this point. Uh, November, December, January, there is rain around. But um, yeah, and then if we look at this, so this is a different forecast. This is a European center forecast. Um, but it pretty much says the same thing as the bomb. For this region, anything in white, it's kind of a 50-50 chance. So not a huge amount of information in the forecast at the moment specifically for this region. But chat with Emily um, in a couple weeks or a month and see if it's changed at all, because they do change quite a bit. And going to end in just a second. Uh, hope is not a plan. It's always a good message. 
Okay, so final slide. Uh, this is a forecast. Anybody use these? Elders, Willy Weather, the seven day forecast? Yep, okay, cool. Um, so we can see here on Sunday, the 10th of October, there's an 80% chance of any rain, of rain, okay? And then the rainfall range given is two to eight millimeters. So we look at this and we say, okay, there's an 80% chance of at least two to eight millimeters. Cool? No, actually, what this forecast means is that there is an 80% chance of any rain, um, and any rain is defined as at least 0.2 millimeters. So there is an 80% chance of 0.2 millimeters. There is a 50% chance, or a 1 in 2 chance, of 2 millimeters, and there's only a 25% chance, or a 1 in 4 chance, of 8 millimeters. And every single forecast that's written this way, where there's a percentage chance of rain and then a range given, that's how you interpret all of them. It doesn't matter if you go to the elder side or the Willy Weather side or anything. Is that news to anyone? A couple, yeah. Because <laughs> most people, they go, oh, the bloody bomb, they always get it wrong. We only got one mil. No, it's actually, they just write the forecast in a very non-intuitive way. Um, however, they will be changing this forecast early next year and making it clearer. But please tell everybody that you know and like. Thank you.